Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Bob Johnson with another great addition for you this afternoon. Uh, he's probably one of the most asked for guests by our fans of Heartbeat Radio, especially our fans in the uh, Australia, New Zealand area, uh, the great Tony Gurria. And we'll be talking to Tony this afternoon. Uh, but before that, I'd like to uh, introduce from Portland Wrestling, Mr. Matt Mers. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio. Well, thank you very much, Bob Johnson. Always a pleasure to be here each and every week when I can make it. And I'm truly fascinated to hear more about Mr. Gurria's career because this is a man who has survived in the business longer than most people have been watching wrestling. And so it should be quite a a learning experience if we are fortunate enough to pick his brain and get some lessons for all of us younger people out there so we can survive and thrive in the wrestling business ourselves in this unusual time. So thanks very much for having me, Bob. Always a pleasure. Okay, great. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to the host of our show. He's a wrestler, booker, author, writer, trainer. Welcome back to Heartbeat Radio, Mr. Bruce Hart. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to Tony. You know, it, it speaks volumes just about Tony's character and integrity that he's kind of, uh, you know, survived all the different, you know, he's been, been around the business for in particular the WWF and WWE and WWF for over 40 years you know and uh Tony's one of those guys that uh you never hear anyone say a bad word about him you know which is probably why he's survived and uh thrived in all these different uh periods of you know turbulence in the wrestling business fascinating history though coming from new zealand new zealand's a funny place because uh it's way down on the other end of the world but uh for whatever reason it turned out some of the biggest names in wrestling history people like pat o'connor and uh peter maivio is out of there and john de silva and uh steve rickard people like that so it's got a long proud history and uh it's and uh, Tony's one of the guys that, uh, you know, is kind of first and foremost when you're talking about the uh, New Zealand wrestling scene. You know, his name always comes up. And uh, so I'm looking forward to just catching up with Tony. You know, I, uh, I've i known a lot of Tony's friends and uh, people that he tag teamed with and worked for and all like that. So I'll let you bring the man on, Bob. He was a former NWA tag champion. With a uh, great Pat Patterson, uh, he was not one but five times WWF Tag Team Champion with guys like uh, Haystack, Calhoun, Dean Ho, Larry Zabisco, and twice with Mr. Uh, Rick Martel. He's rest- wrestled the very best of them, including some classic matches with Superstar Billy Graham and Harley Race. But without any further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Tony, to Heartbeat Radio. Well, thank you very much, Bob. And I don't want to annoy anybody up north, but I, at the very moment, at Cocoa Beach, Florida, where it is 73 degrees and the sun is shining. So uh, <laughs> I think I deserve this. Yeah, yeah we, uh, we're about Calgary, Alberta, and about 20 below, and uh, the, the snow is, you know, coming down. So, <laughs> so make sure you got your heat up. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you how your the maybe the early evolution of your career you broke in and uh, was was Steve Rickard still <laughs> promoting down then? Yeah, actually, that, that Steve Rickard promoted the most of New Zealand, and uh, in Auckland there was a promoter called Ernie Pinches, and there was a wrestler there called Wild Don Scott, and he approached me at the rugby club where I played rugby and asked me if I'd be interested in wrestling, you know. So I said, yeah. But it took me about 18 months because we followed up on the first meeting, and then it was a year later, you know, that uh, I started training and then got into it. And I think my first match was 1969 in the first week in October at the New Zealand Auckland, sorry, YMCA. (laughs) 
and uh, then I went on from there, and the promoter, Ernie, didn't want me to, it was a, like a part-time job. I had my regular job playing cement sidewalks, and the promoter didn't want me to play rugby in case I got hurt. Well, you know, I'm about 23 years old, and we never got hurt. So I can continued to play, and then he didn't book me which really didn't worry me that much. Then they wanted somebody to go to Australia for two weeks, so they asked me. So away I went, and that started my career. I ended there up in Australia actually eight weeks, where I met Mark Lewin, Spiros Arion, Curtis Oh, Isaiah, yeah, the, uh, the infamous. Kelly Cox, yeah. Uh, yeah, you must have. You have to be a good man to have survived that. You know, that was kind of a... <laughs> I know we had them up here, Mark King Curtis. Uh, it, it was always uh, bloodbaths every night. <laughs> kind of the, uh, the outer limits of extremism or whatever. But, um, but they they had a good run there, though, in Australia. And I was I'm not sure if Barnett was promoting or uh, that, that was kind of uh, considered a hot spot at one point. When did you start with Vince Sr. back in no, the no, early 70s? Actually, I went back and uh, Jim Barnett, the promoter at the time, he said, you know, he'd like to have me come back in two or three weeks. He was doing a trip to Asia, you know, I believe uh, Singapore and Thailand and places like that. Hong Kong. Yeah. And um, so I said, okay. So I went back home and I was kind of waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing happened. So consequently, I spent my money. And, uh, and then he, he, he called me back. Uh, for maybe, you know, I thought it was going to be about eight weeks. It was 12 weeks in Australia. And uh, at that particular time, he asked me if I'd be interested in coming to the United States. And I'd heard from the local boys there, the Australian boys that were working locally, you know, that he only asked you one time. So the question was, would you like to go to the United States and wrestle? And immediately I said yes. You know, because uh, I wasn't going to get asked again. And then he put me in touch with Eddie Graham, and he worked on a uh, visa for me. So I thought I'd come over for one year. And I didn't quite have enough money for a round-trip ticket, so I had to borrow some money against my car, which, incidentally, I was turned down. And then I debated with the guy, told him what I was doing, and then I got it. So I landed in Tampa, Florida, March 19th, 1972, and that's where I started. And the first match was, uh, I was with Johnny Gray, another Australian boy, and we came over as partners. And our first match was in Orlando, March 20th. It was a Monday night, and it was against J.C. Dykes and the Infernos. And, oh, they were um, a hot team then, yeah, the mask guys. Yeah. Yeah, so you know we've done pretty well. I mean, I was I was very inexperienced, you know. So I just went out there and done what I thought was right, and just uh, followed anyway. It, it moved. I was there for like seven months, and my partner Johnny went back home. I mentioned about you know going up to New York, which was suggested by Tony Marino, who was I think he played Batman or something at one time. Oh, yeah, I remember the Tony. He worked for us later on. Yeah. Uh, pretty powerful-looking yeah. uh, Italian guy, Tony. Yeah. yeah, but that was to go to Buffalo, and I mentioned it to Eddie, you know, and Eddie said, no, you don't want to go there. He says, let me give Vince McMahon a call. Anyway, he called Vince right there, was right in front of him, and booked me. So I had my first television appearance for Vince because I had two TV appearances three weeks apart. And that was September 20th, 1972. And then I went up and started, I believe, October 28th in Patterson, New Jersey, in 1972 against, I think it was Joe Turco. And uh, there I went. I was only going to stay for a year. So I had uh, like five months left of my visa. And then they renewed it and renewed it. So that was it. Are you, you're an American naturalized now, I assume, Tony? Or yeah. Uh, 
what was the hierarchy then? I guess Fitz Senior and uh, was Gorilla in there at that time? I assume or yeah, yeah. Gorilla uh, was wrestling. And he was uh, he was Todd Ona, you know, and he was very yeah. helpful a lot. I th- I'd probably say the most helpful was uh, was Fuji. Yeah, and then uh, they brought in Haystacks Calhoun, which I heard was a kind of a spur of the moment thing for Vince to do because Vince had, uh, I heard, he had Ray Stevens and uh, Nick Bockwinkle coming in for the summer, and then they canceled out. But Haystacks used to come in for the summer, and I believe I was Rookie of the Year that year, so he put me with Haystacks, as a team against Fuji and Tanaka, and and that Haystacks actually got me over, you know, by doing that, that kind of, you know, got me the push because, you know, in all honesty, Fuji and Tanaka couldn't do a lot with Haystacks, so they kept me in the ring. <laughs> and uh, when I made the tag, you know, it was... Uh, that's what the people wanted to see. So that's what he came. I was following. I was, you know, green. And what's that, yeah. though? Then that's Dean Hoeing, and he was the Kung Fu guy, you know, karate guy against Fuji and Tanaka once again, and that was successful. Then the Valiant Brothers, because we were oh. over, you know, the Valiant got over. I think I'd crossed paths with them before when they were John, John L. Sullivan and... Uh... John, yeah. John Valen or whatever, you know. And, uh, yeah, John Valiant, and then they brought Jerry Valiant in. Uh, oh, Guy Mitchell. Is that his Guy name? Mitchell, uh, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was a good guy, too. But yeah, I a good worker. Most, He's uh, under underrated, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, he was very good. And, and, and he was pretty good on the uh, on the up and up, too, you know. He'd take your legs out and put you on your backside before you. But he was such a nice guy, you know. But I think the yeah. most important about back then, you know, we had, you know, we had fun, even though we, you know, we worked hard, but we enjoyed each other, you know, and what we accomplished. The territory was a lot smaller at that time, obviously. Uh, what did they mostly work? The New York, Boston, Philly, that that kind of east, the big East Coast yeah. cities. Or? When I started there, we went from Washington D.C. to Bangor, Maine. You know, including Boston, Providence, uh, New, New York, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, Albany. Yeah, that was it at the time. And then we stretched out. We went to Pittsburgh about once a month. And the, and, and the only regular towns were every three weeks we went to Portland and Bangor. And then every Friday night we were in, uh, where the heck were we, just outside of Providence. North Attleboro, a little town, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a little building held about uh, 400 people and pretty much packed it every night, every Friday night. And Mr. Guria, if I can ask, uh, in all that time yeah. you were feuding with uh, Tanaka and Fuji, what was yeah. the best rib you saw Fuji pull? I'll have to think about that. I know what he did. Uh, I wasn't there, but I... I heard about it. He cooked up uh, a bunch of dog food and had people over for dinner and fed them dog food, and they enjoyed (laughs) it. (laughs) (laughs) But there was one one good one. I think he did it for Tanaka. He jacked up his car when it was in the snow. You you know, he jacked his car up and and put the the back of it on um, jack stands, and... (laughs) When Tanaka got in, I think it was Tanaka, got in to leave because all, all that happened was his wheels would spin. <laughs> <laughs> and I know yeah, you also and, teamed uh, up with Larry Zabisco also. And uh, I've always yeah. been kind of curious about Larry's evolution in the business because it's like, you know, he started with WWF, it seems, and under Bruno, and then made that yeah. jump to Vern Gagne, which kind of just threw me off, but I was just a little kid at the time. So what what was the deal with that? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I remember when Larry came in, and then uh, I brought him on board with me, and uh, I had him stay with me for a few weeks till he found an apartment. And then uh, I heard, 
you know, Monsoon, who was an agent, one of the owners, he said to Larry, he says, well, you're finishing up, you know, a week from Tuesday or something like this, you know. So I said, holy Jesus. So, you know, I wasn't too happy with that. I wasn't, you know, and because Larry wasn't. I was, well, what am I going to do? And then Tuesday we had TV and they put the belts on us. I don't know whether Monsoon was playing a rib or not. But, I remember um, Larry worked out out in uh, Vancouver under the name of Larry Whistler. Yeah, that he was, was kind of a, a mid mid card guy in uh, working yeah. with Kaniski and Dean Ho and those guys. And, uh, and then next thing, he was back under the name of Larry Zabisco, and he seemed to evolve into a pretty uh, marketable heel there with Bruno and yeah, the, uh, yeah, he could, he'd been yeah, a baby he face. Talk. Yeah, and he was a good wrestler, and he had good crowd psychology also. Who else were main heels at that time, Tony, working with Bruno? Yeah, the guys like uh, Stan, Stan Stasiak, Stan the Man. Oh, yeah, he was yeah. another guy Stuart he was started up here. Yeah, there was uh, Lonnie Main. Oh, yeah. Do you remember Moon Dog, Lonnie Main? Yeah. Oh, that yeah. Was a, that was... That was about the toughest match I ever had. Uh, we literally beat each other in the Madison Square Garden. It was unbelievable. I was sore for days. I've got a message here from uh, Vinny. He was saying, uh, could you ask Tony, uh, when he was involved with the WWF, what made uh, Captain Lou and the Grand Wizard such great uh, managers? I just missed. Captain Lou and the Grand Wizard up in 72 when I got there. But, uh, you know, Lou was just completely off the wall, you know, and, and he'd do anything to get a, a, a raise out of the crowd. He just worked as hard as he could when he was front of the crowd. And, of course, the Wizard with his crowd psychology, and he knew what to say. And uh, he put his guy over and put his opponent over and uh, made the match, made the people you know, want to come and come and see and uh, who was Lou like managing that? then, or did he did he he wrestled much or strictly a manager? I know Wizard was only a manager, but uh... yeah, but but Lou would get into the ring periodically. Uh, you know, you'd build up to uh, an angle, you know, where Lou was interfering, interfering, and and finally, you know, the commission would say, "All right, Lou." It's going to be a six-man tag, you know, and then, of course, he'd stay, stay out of the ring till it was time to get in, and, you know, the fans would go absolutely crazy because they wanted to see you get to Lou, you know. But he never got beat. He left the ring, and that's what kept him so marketable. I remember uh, Tony, another guy named Tony Altimore. Yeah, Tony um, just uh, hang, hang around... Uh, the, the New York Territory for the longest time, and anything that needed to be done, you know, he was there. And if uh, there were short people on a card, you know, he'd fall in. And uh, he was comfortable. He was a lot a minute, old Tony. I was going to ask you, Tony, uh, I heard old Hulk had been in there, Sterling Golden or some such thing, but yeah. when was no, that? No, he... Yeah, from what I understand, he was there when I got back there, I think in 77, I think, 77, 78. And uh, I believe Vince Sr. gave him the name of Hulk Hogan. And he was Sterling Golden, but that was down south. I think uh, in, he might have been in Atlanta or Tennessee, I'm not sure. And then I know Vince Sr. knew he had something in Hulk but he didn't have a position for him. This is what I'm, you know, that's what I picked yeah. up. And I, and that was I during wrestled. the era of Bob Backlund's. Yeah, it could have been then, yeah. You know, I wrestled Hulk once or twice while he was there. And actually, Brutus Beefcake at that time, I remember, you know, we asked him, or the, the agent asked him, we were shorter guys, he said, do you want to work tonight? And he said no, so he wasn't really interested in Doing too much, and then after that, that's when he went to Minnesota, which I believe was around 1980. Vince went and 
talked to him and pulled him back. And I remember the first time he was in Allentown doing an interview, and I said, what the hell is this, you know? That was the foundation of the WWE as we know it. You know? Did you forecast the rise of Hulk Hogan? Did you see what he was going to do? Oh, well, I could see his intensity just on the on, on the interviews. And then, of course, it takes a little while, you, you know, to get over with the public. But I, I could see it rising. But I uh, – that was about 84 that uh, I believe that, that Hulk started there. And Vince started this whole thing. You know, uh, you know the train rolling. You know, and I didn't become an agent till '87. Uh, okay. And, and I was wrestling like just you know once in a while for that because I was at the tail end of my career then. This is from uh, Heather in Wanaka, New Zealand, and uh, she said uh, if you could maybe describe what an agent is. She's not sure what 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 an agent is or. What, he, what they do, or if you could briefly oh, describe to our yeah, fans what the agent does. In the beginning, we were road agents, uh, you know, and then later on, we came producers uh, because we produced the show. Like when we went, we went, okay, let's say, uh, okay, we're going to Nashville. So we fly into Nashville. We got the card all lined up, get to the building two hours before showtime, make sure the ring is all set and everything. And the, the uh, wrestlers should be in about an hour before showtime, so, you know, make sure everybody's there so we don't have to make any changes. And then we line up the matches and uh, just oversee the whole show. You know, of course, in the old days, it was line up the matches, but in the newer days, you know, we had uh, meet and greets and then the autograph sessions to take care of before the matches and sometimes at half time. Uh, or in half time. I'm talking rugby now. Um, <laughs> at intermission. intermission. Yeah, you know, there, there might be a radio interview or, or a television interview or something, so we'd be responsible for getting all that. And there were uh, two of us, and then one guy would take care of the box office and, and, and do settle up with that. The other guy would take uh, care of the uh, what's going on in the ring. And uh, and then the travel responsibilities because of snow, then we'd have to make a decision of what we're going to do. Like I remember in St. Louis one time, it was uh, a day after New Year's Eve, I think, and uh, we had to get from St. Louis to an afternoon event in Dayton, Ohio, but we were flying in in Columbus because we had a, an event in Columbus that night and we couldn't get out. So by the time we were able to get out, we couldn't make the Dayton show. So that had to be postponed for another date. But uh, stuff like that. I mean, I, I was in Bangor, Maine one time, and there was a storm going through Boston. We had to go to Halifax. And there was also a storm <laughs> came through Pittsburgh that kept the wrestlers in their hotels for three days. And that storm went up through Montreal, which was our next calling. But our plane was going through Boston to Halifax, and Boston was closed, so I rented two planes, 19-seaters, for I think there was 28 of us all together. So I had to get the average weight of the guys and how much baggage they were taking. Anyway, we got to Halifax, and then from Halifax we went on, flew into Montreal, drove to Ottawa, done that show, came back, and done the one in Montreal. Never missed anything. You know, that's the type of thing a road agent did. I've got, a, I've got another <laughs> uh, message came, came through here, and uh, this is from a good friend of ours, Jason, in Newcastle, Australia. Jason... Uh, uh, wrestled for uh, Stampede a few years ago, and then he emigrated to the to the place that they don't have any snow. So, but uh, he's a friend of ours, and uh, he's been a long time follower of yours. And he asked if you could uh, tell a uh, tell the uh, fans a couple a story or two of the great Andre the Giant. Yeah, I'm, I met Andre in February. Uh, yeah, February of '72 in New Zealand. It was just before, about a month before I left. Uh, to come to the United States, and and Andre was only about 
three months older than me. So we had something in common. We were both born in a very good year. And uh, when he came to New York, you know, he recognized me. I was there, and, uh, uh, you know, I walked in, and he was there, and he came right up to me. He said, Tony, he remembered my name and everything with one meeting. So, you know, he was a kind of a big guy, so, uh, uh, you know, a lot of guys didn't want to put him in his in their car. Well, I had a big old Ford Brougham, LTD. So I took him and his manager, uh, Frank Valois, with me and uh i think what one trip we went from uh new york down to philadelphia wrestled and from philadelphia came back to new haven connecticut and uh, and, and i bought two cases of beer and i i'm i might have drank only, only two beers. yeah i might have drank four beers and his manager probably drank six and we ran out of beer before we got to the George Washington Bridge. So I went there and I bought another three six-packs, Paul. And before we got to the Connecticut border, Andre had finished the 12 beers. So I, I don't know how many he drank in total, probably 40 at least. Yeah. I remember, Tony, they always used used to uh, look like little uh, salt and pepper shakers in Andre's hands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you just see the top of the the beer bottle, and that was about it. And Mr. Gurria, were you a were you a face your entire career there with Vince Senior? I was. There was a couple of opportunities. One time, I wrestled Lenny Popo, who was a face, and I thought I might just try it out in a little town. But Lenny was hurting, so I really couldn't uh, I couldn't come up with anything that I could protect him, you know, and. Uh, then I wrestled Bob Backlund, but with Bob, I just had a, uh, we just had a straight face match, you know, which mm-hmm. Bob was very good. He thanked me for it. You know, we'd done a couple of moves that he was accustomed to. You know, I knew where he was in the match, you know, and uh, I put myself in position, you know, and, and he picked up on it and away we went. Incidentally, Bob has a book out and I've been reading it and it's, uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm not a big reader but I'm enjoying it. And it might be because I've got about 12 mentions in it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another caller, Harold from Mississauga, Ontario. He's a regular uh, watcher of the uh, WWE Network, and he was uh, watching uh, The Vengeance 2007 in a match with Sergeant Slaughter and Jimmy Snuka uh, against Deuce and Domino. And uh, uh, he's remember you uh, and your former tag team partner, Rick Martell, coming to the aid yeah. of uh, Slaughter. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? That's from Harold in Mississauga. Rick was invited down there. I was an agent at the time. And, uh, you know, and the the deal was they wanted us to go to ringside and be insulted by Deuce and Domino, which I didn't know was going to happen, you know, so we took it. But then at the end of the match, Deuce and Domino uh, had their hands raised, and then they went back. Uh, they gave us a bit of lip, and then they went back on to uh, Snooker and Slaughter. At the right moment, Rick and I made our move, you know, made the big save. And uh, we got a heck of a pop there. It kind of surprised me because I'd never wrestled in Houston. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't know how much of a pop this is going to get. But I'll pat myself on the back, and Rick, too. That was about the biggest pop of the night. And then I went backstage, and uh, one of the girls, you know, she was jumping up and down. She says, oh, my God, Tony, oh, my God. Everybody popped back here. And then I heard even the television crew pop. You know, but basically, guys, it's just the timing, you know, that – that that gets that um, pop and that roar from the crowd. I remember if I could get, you know, get, and I, you know, thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, if I just go back a bit to when um, uh, Randy Orton came in and they brought his dad in and his dad, uh, you know, had some business, you know, at the ring during the match, you know, or otherwise a run-in. But Bob's 
timing was just so magnificent. You know, it's not that he did a lot, you know. He just did what had to be done and uh, and got the job done. All-time magic. <laughs> I have a caller from Area Code 386. Uh, welcome to Heartbeat Radio. Tell us where you're calling from and your name, and welcome to Heartbeat Radio. Hey, I'm hello. calling from the Iron Horse, and hello, mate. Good. <laughs> How the hell are you? <laughs> I don't usually talk to people from that far south in New Zealand. I mean, <laughs> Dunedin. Who ever heard of Dunedin besides Cadbury chocolate? <laughs> I know, and they've got, a Dine- they've got a Dunedin in Florida, too. I'll have to go visit, seeing it's the same same name. When I say Dunedin, yeah. they think I'm from Florida. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll be. What a surprise this is. Yeah, so I'm I'm sitting uh, I'm sitting at the Iron Horse. Uh, you know, I hope you can't hear the music's going in the background. And I thought, oh, mm-hmm. it's a heartbeat radio. I need to call my older uh, my old maid and tell him what a lovely day it is here. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I that's what I did in the beginning. I said, uh, you know, I'm at, uh, 75 degrees down in Cocoa Beach. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Because you're up in Daytona. I'm I'm up I'm up in Daytona, and it's just as nice. What a perfect day it is. It is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I even got oh, a call no, I... from Wanaka. I got a call from Wanaka, New Zealand, or uh, you know, a, a question, and from Red Beach, New Zealand. Oh my gosh, Wanaka! That's my old horn. I go. I spend a lot of time in Wanaka, and it's the place that you need to go to too. Yeah, next year I think I'm going on the tour. How did you well, guys actually, come to know each other? Yeah, I was. Uh, well, I, I met I met Barbara and um, and Frank in, in uh, maybe 1979. I was in Australia for about. Uh, Three weeks. I was going to Japan, but I, I went home. So I went to Australia, worked for three weeks. I went down to New Zealand for a visit for a couple of weeks, then up to Japan. And Barbara was uh, working at the hotel we were staying at, and of course she's from New Zealand. So, you know, hi, I'm from New Zealand too, brother. And uh, and that was it. I left, and then I heard, you know, she'd married Frank. But I I met Frank. I was there for a short time, and they want to give me a quick push. Uh, because Andre was coming in. So I worked with Frank on, on uh, Brisbane TV, and he, he gave me one hell of a match. And that was the first time, you know, we'd ever uh, got together. And um, I enjoyed it. I actually screwed up. I missed one spot, you know, and he kind of laughed it off, you know. <laughs> so, you know, that was good. I said, holy Jesus, missed it. But... Um, then we had a battle royal uh, where I went over, and then uh, there was a little conflict between me and Brute Bernard and, and J.J. Dillon, and then I come back the following week, and then they annihilated me because uh, Brute was going to work with Andre. So that was the whole lesson of that tour. <laughs> That's fascinating. Uh, what a memory. Eh? <laughs> getting scared. I know, and when you think about it, it just seems like yesterday, and that was so long ago. And it's so nice yeah, to be able to enough. keep, yeah. yeah, to keep contact, to, to, you know, to come together again and to see old friends again. That's what's what's so nice about some of these, the CAC organization and some of the organizations that you get to see people that you knew way back in the old days, and it's, it's like a family reunion. It was 37 years ago that you and Ricky Martel won the WWF Tag Team titles together, and you guys had a good run there for a year and a half, two years together. Can you kind of tell yeah. me about how that formulated? Yeah, well, uh, Rick came in, and, uh, you know, they put him together with me, and uh, our first match was against the Samoans in Madison Square Garden. Uh, not Madison, sorry, Philadelphia. Uh, spectrum. spectrum. Yeah, you know, everybody took all the Samoans, the Samoans, they, you know, 
They're going to kill you. They're going to kill you. But we went out there and we formulated a uh, a plan, and it went. And um, Offer and Seeker were tickled to death. And we went, we you know, we went around the horn with them, and uh, no problems at all, you know. And everything was good, you know. It was a walk in the park, as far as I'm concerned. And then from them, we went to the Moon Dogs, and the first match was the moon, with the Moon Dogs. It was like there were a couple of uh, pedal cars, you know, up against a couple of bulldozers. Of us being the pedal cars, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and I talk, I talked to them out because we were in Madison Square Garden the next night. I said this isn't going to work. So a formula. I gave them a plan, and uh, we talked about it, and we went out there, and it was like night and day. Of course, you know, Rick was from the heck of the uh, mechanic when it got into the ring. He was fantastic. And and the funny thing about Rick and I, we didn't even have to talk to each other. We just knew what was coming up next. You know, we were on the same wavelength, which you have to be. Nobody was trying to take anything. You know, I wasn't trying to take anything from Rick, and Rick wasn't trying to take anything from me. I was trying to make Rick look good, and he was trying to make me look good. And we, but and in turn, we make our opponents look good. I think that. So can I ask you a little bit about your uh, your time in San Francisco there, teaming with Pat Patterson, wrestling with guys yeah. like Don Morocco and the Royal Kangaroos. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I enjoyed San Francisco. I was able to work out uh, five six days a week in the gym. Uh, Pedro Morales was there, so I hooked up with him. We worked out in the mornings, uh, and. Um, you know, you were home every night. You didn't have to stay home. The longest trip, I think, was um, Fresno, which was about 180 miles. You know, there was Fresno, there was San Jose, there was uh, Sacramento, Stockton, Modesto on a Friday night. And uh, I remember working, uh, you know, with Don. Had some, I thought we had some pretty decent matches, me and Don. And then when I was that? Huh? When was that, Tony? Was that with Roy Shires? Yeah, Roy Shires in about '76. And you know, Pat and I we hooked up and took the uh, the title, the NWA Tag Team Title. But I remember, I remember having a match with um, uh, Jerry Monty. He was a local guy. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got. I got the match on Wednesday night from Shires, and uh, I said uh, to Roy, I says, because uh, Jerry was a baby, you know, I said, is this going to be a, a baby face match? And Roy said, yeah, and he looked at me, and he said, why, can't you handle it? I said, no, I just I just want to think about it, you know, so we got it. So long story short, we had the match. And uh, I threw a couple of moves in there that I know Roy liked. And then when I came through after the match, Roy was there to shake my hands, and Pat said, he's never done that. <laughs> so I was, I was pretty uh, tickled about that. And and Jerry, you know, Jerry was a good hand. Jerry Monty. So I have a, another caller ca- calling in. Uh, yeah. Mary Code 770, seven, seven, oh, I think that's... Maybe in Texas or something. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Tyson Dean. Well, Atlanta. Asked for Miss. Yes, sir. Um, asked Mister yeah. Guerrero what and, you know. What are some things you can do for you know more opportunities for bigger looks from bigger promotions? A lot of it now is you know based on your looks. You know with uh, you know you're working out. You know with weights where you know you can change the way you look, and and to be crisp, not to rush with anything you're doing and make it look like it's, as we say back home, fair dinkum, you know, which is the real thing. Yes, sir. And, of course, of course, your interviews these days are very, very important. More more so important than what they were, even though they were important years ago, they're more important now. So uh, that would probably be 
the top of the list. Why are the promos more important today, Mr. Gurria? Well, I would say that the people are getting to get a good visual and know who you are. And if you, you know, you're saying the right, you know, the right thing and they're listening to you. Like there were some guys, I wasn't a good uh, promo guy. I, I don't I, I just kind of didn't have it unless I had a match and then I was relaxed and I could go, you know, right through it. But um, there were a couple of guys that weren't bad, but they rushed it. And the idea was to pause and they could just keep the tension. Like, he, like not to go out there and talk like this and say, well, the cars are going down the road, the cars are coming up and down the road, and there's a helicopter flying over. He said, the cars are going down the road, the cars are coming up the road. You know, you have their attention. Throughout your career, sir, who would you say are three or four of the best talkers you saw? Oh, Lou Albano, uh, Jake the Snake, Miller, Al Cox, and King Curtis Iacetta. Curtis was very good. I guess we're coming close to finish, but, uh, you know, I just like to, to say that, you know, when I first came here, I just want to give a... Uh, a little bit of, uh, even though he's he's gone now, but Jack Briscoe was uh, a great help to me when I first started. If it wasn't for Jack, I probably would have gone back to New Zealand and you wouldn't be talking to me today. What is the most important piece of advice Jack Briscoe gave you when you were coming up that might help younger people improve their game? Make your opponent look good. How do you survive for 40 years at the top of the wrestling business? I just kind of did what I thought was right. And if it, if it wasn't right, then I changed it. But, you know, to me it was a job. So, uh, you know, even getting in the ring, you know, that was a job. So, Check your ego at the door and do what's best for business. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I work with somebody that, 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 that thought that the uh, – needed to, you know, take the whole match. And then at the end of the match, I had to do something. So now suddenly they made me the toughest guy in the world because they hit me with everything but the kitchen sink. And then I came back and uh, turned them into a pretzel. <laughs> Common sense, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me just suggest yeah. to all the fans out there very quickly. I would just like to humbly suggest you go onto Facebook, you check out Stampede Wrestling, you check out Heartbeat Radio, you check out Portland Wrestling. You can go to youtube.com forward slash legit pro wrestling and watch the absolute best of Heartbeat Radio. The last two shows that I put up were the Don Morocco and Rocky Iokea shoot video, which is maybe my favorite episode of Heartbeat Radio because it was just like a road trip with the boys. And very much the Ken Patera video I just put up last night. Uh, also is is the same way where it's just this is honest, heartfelt conversation that you just don't usually get. And that's what I love about Heartbeat Radio is it's it's really like you're part of the business if you listen to this show. I endorse that. I, I you know, I, that's the initiative or the intent of this show is to uh, just kind of be almost like you were – in the dressing room or in one of the uh, long road trips and you're just kind of kicking around perspectives about the business, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. nothing staged, no, everything's just pretty much improv, you know, and uh, I always uh, enjoy just even like today with Tony getting just kind of perspectives about random stuff, you know, yeah. from back, back in the day and, you know, that, that's kind of uh, what, we're seeking to do so but very well put there Matt 